thank, thank you, Rosie. I think I should stress that I didn't kick off the, the, the Herdy Shepherd phenomenon. Um, he did it all by himself. About two or three years ago, uh, I, I'm a, a ferociously enthusiastic tweeter, uh, and so is my wife. We both love the Lake District. We have got a Collie Cross dog, and we, she, I think she may have spotted these pictures first, said, look at these, these are beautiful. And uh, we both started following Herdy Shepherd One. Uh, he was so slow off the mark, there was apparently already a Herdy Shepherd, so he had to be Herdy Shepherd One. Um, during that, the great snows of... That was me. I didn't know how to use Twitter properly. So oh, I right, to, yeah. I had to open a new account. Yeah. He plays the very naive, you know, guy from the sticks who's never been to London. But as you're here, he has been to London before. Anyway, uh, I've been following him for a couple of years, and um, it's been um, one of the most exciting things about, um, about the way social media has taken hold, this mixture of the old and the new, and I think it's, um, it's a great example. Um, so let's start, James, um, by reminding people what you were like, just what a snotty kid you were at 15 or 16, because here you are, the sophisticated man about town, best-selling author. What did you want to do when you were 16? Did you want to go to university? Did you want to... What did you want to do? I wanted to get the hell out of school as quickly mm. as possible. Um, and the truth is, I just wanted to be like my grandfather. My grandfather was my hero when I was growing up, and he was just a, I say just, I shouldn't say just, he was a shepherd in the Lake District and a farmer. And I was, um, I was a horrible 15-year-old because I didn't want anything to do with school. I'd, I'd completely rejected it all. It didn't seem to be anything to do with me. And it seemed to be all about going to university and making you become somebody else and have a whole new life. And I didn't want a whole new life. I liked the life we had already quite a lot. So I, um, I occasionally bump into my teachers now in the supermarket and they just look absolutely terrified. I'm like, no, no, it's... <laughs> it's, 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 it's there was some talk that you wanted to burn down the school? Uh, no, that wasn't me. I just would have clapped if somebody else had that. <laughs> so no, but I suppose there's a serious point, which is I... There's nothing unique about me. I mean, you just have to look at the... I'm going to get a bit nerdy now, but you just have to look at the statistics about education and you see that uh, white working class or lads from working families uh, that do terribly in exams, don't they? There's something about the schooling system that doesn't work for lots of people like I was. And uh, I think lots of those kids might be like I was. They want to be what their families are. Even sometimes when it's maybe outdated and it's really difficult to be what your father or your grandfather was, you perhaps don't want what school's offering. So, so what, what was your father and what were, was your grandfather? T tell us about the, the farm where you grew up. The, they had two farms um, that they, wor they worked together, basically. They had a rented farm, so uh, my, grandfather, uh, my grandfather struck out when he was about 20 years old, borrowed money from his mother, and he went and he took a rented farm to start, start a sort of new farming enterprise away from his own father because fathers and sons in my family never really get on until it's too late, probably. But um, uh, So he struck out on his own, and he took a rented farm, and then about 20 years later, he bought a farm in the Lake District, a small farm. And um, I might need a napkin, actually, because those, well, those um, lights are really hot. But, uh, so he bought a farm in the Lake District, and that's where I live now. So it's a 180-acre hill farm. And, uh, yeah, and we have a flock of sheep that goes onto the fells, and we breed... Herdwick sheep and Swildale sheep. So how, lo how long have your family, how, how far can you trace it back, the, their tra involvement in we can, sheep? The earliest mem uh, mention we can find of our family is in 1420, and that's about a five-minute bike ride from where we are now, and in their parish called Dacre. And I think they've always been trouble, because in 1420, the only reason that they're mentioned is that they were having a dispute about a piece of land with a local landlord who said it wasn't theirs, and they said it, they were saying it was theirs, so... Um, but uh, yeah, it says, it says on the book cover, I think that we've been there for 600 years, but I think the truth is the paperwork runs out after 600, 600 <laughs> years. The truth is we're probably there for miles longer, is what mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. tell me. So. Um, and what... You, you were at school, you are disgruntled, you didn't like the like of, look of school. Uh, you left school, did you, did, you, did you have exams? Did you pass exams? Uh, no. Um, oh, the emergency you. napkins thank arrived. <laughs> quite hot up here. Yeah. Um, no, I left, I, I got a, um, 
about three months before the exams, I realised I'd completely blown it. Cause I had this is your GCSEs? These are my GCSEs. I realised I'd completely blown it, so I didn't want to get a sort of middling mark and people think that was the best I could do. So I thought it was hilarious as a 15-year-old. It's not funny, by the way, it's just really dumb. But as a 15-year-old, I thought it was hilarious to, to really flunk the exams. So um, I did other hilarious 15-year-old things, like I did the right answers to the questions, but I did them in the wrong... Bo wrong box on the paper. <laughs> you're Hil trouble. Yeah, hil <laughs> hilarious when you're 15. So my yeah. geography teacher looked like he wanted to hit me when he saw the exam results. But, um, but no, I just, I just wanted to get out of there. It felt like it was for other people, for other reasons, and it was nothing to do with us. And, um, and I was a horrible, chippy 15-year-old who my reaction to it was sort of, well, screw you. I, I want out of here. I don't want anything to do with this place. It's nothing to do with me. That's not healthy or good or to be admired in any way. I'm not condoning it, but that's how I was when I was 15. And was the, the life that you saw your dad and your grandfather living, what, what was attractive about that? Because it's, it's a hard life, isn't it? It is a hard life, but, but it's a quite an independent life and quite a proud life. And, and I just like the fact that they were their own bosses. They were in charge of what they did, and the, to a degree. And... They were quite free, and they seemed to belong where they were. They didn't seem confused about who they were, like lots of other people sometimes do. Um, they just seemed absolutely rock solid. They knew what their purpose in the world was, and they knew what their job was, and they knew what you did in the morning when you got up, and they knew what you did last thing at night, and their lives had a sort of rhythm, and it, it all made sense to me. I think um, there were lots of books written. I think that historically, most books have been written by the smart kid that wanted to leave, and they write about it looking back about how narrow-minded it was or how provincial or how dumb or mean or whatever it was. Um, and I'm sure that's true for lots of people. That probably explains why lots of people left the land for other opportunities. But because what, what were your, your, your peers doing, the, the other 15-year-olds in, um, in the, the north the, of the Lake District? The smart academic ones had gone to the grammar school. It was at mm. the other side of town, and they were, they mm. were bright academic kids. They worked mm. hard at school. They went to university, did all sorts of uh, interesting things. But all the ones at my school were a bit like me. They, they thought school was a waste of time and they were just filling time in and uh, doing hilarious things like trying to burn the school down and things like that. I mean, I shouldn't even laugh. It just, mm -hmm. but it, and it was only later I watched the Ken Loach film, you know, the Kess film with that mm -hmm. kid in who just, yeah. and that just like made me la almost cry with laughter because that was just what it was like. It was like a farce. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to be there. The, not all of the teachers, I'm sure there were some amazing teachers there that we didn't give a chance, but. Lots of the teachers were just fed up of it because the kids didn't want to be there. and It was the dump school at the other side of town. And um, So, yeah, it all sounds a bit bleak, this, doesn't it? Can we cheer it up a bit? <laughs> Christ. So, what, what was not so bleak about the shepherd's life? Because you, you then started uh, working for your, for your dad. Yeah. And what, what, was your, what, 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 what were you learning? And how, I, I presume, actually, you picked up quite a lot of it. Um, much younger, you'd been working sort of on the farm even while you yeah. were at school. Yeah, the truth is even now on the farms, they're like 10-year-old, 12-year-old kids that have done it their whole lives. No, no loads. They're already quite good shepherds. They already know how to judge sheep. They're already... I went shepherding with, with you and your yeah. daughters yeah. were already, you know, yeah, got their little crooks. Yeah, they, they grow up with it. They know what the fields are called. They know yeah. what the different bloodlines in the flock are. They know um, just hundreds of things that would be really difficult to start and learn when you're older. So... Mm. I was that kind of kid, so uh, nobody in my family thought, apart from my mother, bless her, um, the men in my family didn't think that failing school was a bad thing or a disappointment or anything. They were more interested in the fact that I was a smart kid on the farm who knew about the sheep and who could be trusted to do responsible things on the farm and who could sell sheep if somebody came in the evening to buy them and they weren't there. You could trust me to, to bar haggle with 80-year-old farmers and sell a sheep for 500 quid or something. So that, that's the stuff in my family that you, historically, you respected and you admired. Um, but I think the other side of it is my mother. Uh, my mother's an off-comer, basically. She's from Lancashire, from a family of... Um, they were basically factory workers, and they believe in self-improvement, of going to school, of becoming a teacher, of climbing out of your working-class, gritty existence. And I think there's a bit of that coming to me, whether I like to admit it or not. There's a bit of that in me from my mum. So even when I was flunking school... I was one of the most bookish kids you'd ever meet. So, uh, so, it's quite, yeah, so it's quite weird. So my love of books dates from the time when I'd just flunked my GCSEs, which sounds like it's back to front, but to me it just seemed like the most normal thing in the world. 
Um, let's come back to that, but first of all, let's, let's go into what, what the shepherd's life... This, this, as is, you, like, this is like, um, what was it? This is your life, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> or in the psychiatrist's yeah. chair. <laughs> <laughs> Even worse. Well, like, was it Michael Aspel? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Um, what, what's the root? What's the root? I mean, it's a hard. It's, it's, lots of people would say it's a hard life, and it's it's not that attractive. What what, what is the routine um, that you were learning as a 16, 17 year old, uh, uh, getting up presumably very early? Which I've got a teenage boy. They don't get up early willingly. You, you did. You don't shout loud enough. My, no. dad, my, my dad said, "Get up." You got up. That was, they were sort of old school. Um, yeah, you did what you were told, and um, whether you wanted to or not, and. And the message, rightly or wrongly, was that the farm was the most important thing and that your job was to be of value to it. Um, it wasn't that you couldn't be something else, but you needed to make your mind up. If you're doing something else, go and work hard at that. Do that other thing. And because I'd chosen to be on the farm, the message was quite clear. Your job's to work very, very hard and to be useful and to contribute to it. Um, and if that sounds negative, I don't mean it to. I... And you might think, I mean, incomers who, who, who visit the Lake District might think, oh, it's, it's, it's not that difficult. These sheep, they look after themselves. You stick them out on the fell. What, what does the work involve? Um... <laughs> easy, easy. <laughs> we're, we're easily going to fill, fill 45 minutes here. Um, no, it's actually quite difficult to look at. Um, no, let me start again. You could quite easily re ranch sheep on a hillside and you would lose a certain number of them to disease and other things. But if you wanted to, there are places in the world where you just stick sheep out in a sort of half wilderness area and then some of them come back in and you sell them. And, but that isn't how shepherding works in a historic landscape like ours. The, the truth is there's loads of work involved in it. So before we came this morning, we had to go around there. Actually, I didn't because I was busy getting those tubs clean, but we sent William, William that's outside. He went around um, the fields with the ewes and lambs in because the... The other breed of sheep we keep, those are herdwicks outside, but the other breed of sheep we keep... Let's just check, first of all, does everybody know what a herdwick looks like? I, 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 I'm an expert on this now, because I've been there. Yeah. Um, so, so, the, so the herdwicks are the ones outside, the swaledales are the ones with the white noses, the black faces and the white spectacles and the horns. Uh, but they, they reach a stage when they're about two months old where their horns are half grown and they do a really crazy, stupid thing with which is they put their head through the wire and then they pull their head back and the horns get stuck. So basically, uh, <laughs> twice a day, we have to go around every single field of those to... This to, is a major design fault. <laughs> it, it is a design fault with the fencing of the sheep, but uh, they will hang themselves. They'll pull backwards, then they'll panic and they'll just lie down. So a job like that takes you an hour in the morning to go around it. We have uh, nine different flocks of sheep at different places around the farm and it would take you a couple of hours every morning to get round all of them and make sure that they're okay, so you're looking for problems. On a lovely sunny morning when nothing goes wrong, that's, that's lovely. That's like riding around the Lake District, enjoying the view, everything's fine. Uh, on a bad morning or a morning when things go wrong, you'll have sheep escaped into other fields, you'll have health problems, you'll have a whole bunch of things kicking off and you're having to sort it out. Um, and at the moment, uh, it's basically the time of year where... There's, a, been, there's a rhythm to the year. There's a seasonal it? rhythm, and yeah. every week of the year there is something that you should be doing and something you should be worrying about and something that you as a shepherd should be intervening in to make sure it's not as bad as it could have been if you were intervening. So there's, um, yeah, there's never really not something to worry about or to think about. So in the next 10 days, we'll, uh, we'll shear all the sheep. So I have 450 sheep that I need to shear. Joe, that's downstairs, that lots of you would have met, he has, um, I think they have about 2,000 sheep, so they have to shear in the next And it, what was the big flock? What, what is, what uh, jo, is... Joe's uh, family, Joe and his dad, Richard, are one of the biggest flocks in the Lake District, so they have about 2,000 yows, I think I'm right in saying. And you said yows? Yeah. Uh, what's a yow? Uh, a yow is Cumbrian dialect for you. Right. And tup, or tip, is Cumbrian dialect for ram. Right. And, um, so those two you've got out there, they're not yowls, are they? No, they're not, because they've right. got big horns and they've got <laughs> testicles, they're tops, basically. Right. Oh, That's how you tell. Yeah. And you can tell whether a Cumbrian farmer's from West Cumbria or the rest of Cumbria, because in West Cumbria they call them tips, and in the rest of Cumbria they call them tops. We're uh, already learning a fantastic yeah. amount. I'm not sure you need to know that. But, yeah, they, yeah. Uh, but Cumbria has a really strong dialect. A lot of the words go back to Viking. So uh, counting to five is Yantan, Tedra, Medra, Pip in Cumbrian. Uh, and... Uh, in London, nobody understands what the hell you're talking about if you're talking Cumbrian, so I, I'm using my phone voice at the moment. Um, <laughs> but if I go to Norway, I can use my real Cumbrian voice. So if I say I'm going down the lawn in, uh, I'm going yam down the lawn in, I'm going to jump over that uh, beck and shut the yat. 
Most, most of you are thinking, what the hell is he talking about? In Norway, they understand that. So you say ganyam, which means going home. And in Norway, uh, they say, ah, ganyam, and going home. And that's because... It's your uh, Viking blood. Yeah, ling linguistically mm. and culturally, a lot of the stuff that we are is, uh, was brought, came on the boats with Vi uh, the Vikings, and the sheep did as well. So, the rhythm of your year. The, right, right now, we're at... Um, we're at uh, uh, Shearing stage. This, this is, isn't, am I right in saying this is the easy stage of the I visited you in yep. uh, beginning of April, which was just before the, yep. what, the, the best and possibly, but possibly the worst state, stage of the year. Is that right? I mean, lambing, uh, it, it, does it all build up to lambing and then, uh, and then it gets easier lambing, or what? Lambing sort of when it starts. Right. Uh, but the, uh, if you talk to somebody like Joe downstairs, Joe, is Joe up here or is he down there? He'll he's be, down there looking he'll, after he'll the, be hiding. The, he's the doing chaps. the real work. He's been the real shepherd today. Um, I hope he's having a beer, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you want to worry about that, because yeah. we're having a lot of beers if we're not careful. But, um, uh, yeah, but uh, basically, um, the year starts in the, in the spring with the lambs. Uh, you move through shearing, which is now making the hay for the winter in the next month. Uh, the autumn, which is really what we think of as the year building to, is when you show your best sheep against the other shepherds and the other flocks. Um, uh, or your, you sell your surplus sheep or your older sheep from the fell that can no longer go back to the fell, you sell them to lowland farmers. Uh, so uh, uh, the stuff that we really care about and find interesting and exciting and, uh, and what a whole year revolves around happens in that period in the autumn. And then there's a really boring, depressing bit after that where you know that there's nothing but winter to look forward to for about eight months. Um, <laughs> And that's where we should all go to the Bahamas for about six weeks. But, um, and then you. And it's such a lucrative business, you can all go to the Bahamas. Yeah, for yeah. Months. No, yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, I'm very lucky. I've written a book, and you've all mm. bought it, and that's very nice. And I'm doing okay. But the truth is, the average income of a hill farm in the Lake District is eight and a half thousand pounds, which is p pitiful for people that work so hard. Uh, and what I found interesting when I visited you was what what it's about. You you think. You, you see Lakeland sheep and you think, ah, oh, they're being bred for wool and for meat. Um, but in your case, neither is quite the case. No, they, they used to be bred for wool. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a friend called Chris Brown that farms in Patterdale, and his wool check in 1750 was 250 pounds. So that farm was a, a very wealthy farm. It was making a lot of money in 1750. And his wool check last year was 250 pounds, mm -hmm. which is about a quarter of what it costs to pay somebody to come and shear them. So wool is worthless um, to us. It's a health and a welfare thing, which is sad, but it's true. Yeah. And up until about eight years ago, the wool was worth so little that it, didn't, it wasn't worth sending it on a wagon because the wagon costs were more than what it was worth, so you burnt it, mm -hmm. which is just depressing because it's one of the world's great products, natural products. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't, we don't breed for wool, sadly. Uh, the spare males from the flock go for meat, and it's Herdwick Hoggett, which is one of the best meats in the world. They had it at the Queen's Coronation, so that's amazing. That's amazing sort of, uh, pro product that comes off the latest district fells. But what we, they're the bits that people think we do, but what we really do is that the mountains, the Pennines, the Lake District, the Welsh Hills, um, all the upland areas of the UK have for, for centuries been the nursery for the national sheep flock. So you breed, you sell breeding stock to lowland farmers. And that's actually far more lucrative than selling animals for meat. Uh, and it's interesting why that adds up, because you would think that, that that didn't add up because eventually somebody's got to yep. take that breeding stock and turn it into something yeah, that well, earns, earns revenue back. I mean, you're, you're, yeah. you're selling on, and they can reach an extraordinary yeah. so, sum, can't yeah, they? Basically, they can. a, sheep, a sheep for meat is worth about £75. Mm -hmm. If it had kept up with inflation through my lifetime, it would have been worth £430. Mm -hmm. So you hear people all the time say that lamb's expensive. It's actually a, less than a quarter of what the price it should be if it kept up with inflation. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so uh, a sheep for meat is worth £75, but a ram, which would that go to mate with 100 ewes and can improve somebody's flock and breed these breeding females, can be worth two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 um, pounds. And I try and breed like 10 of those a year. So I spend far more time worrying about breeding those really, really well than I do about the ones... So how big is your flock overall? We have 450 breeding females, and then we'd have another 170 one-year-old females that don't breed the first year. Uh, and then all the followers. So at the moment, there'd be about 1,000 sheep on the farm. But that's, that would once have been a big farm. It's now not big enough, so I have to do other things to... to and, and, and you, but your focus on all of that is, is breeding... is breeding stock, is, 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 yeah. is getting the... And, and how's that going? 
Uh, it's going okay. Because um, Joe's not here, I can say what I really think, which is yeah. uh, I've, been be I've been beating him quite nicely. At the right. Yeah, that, <laughs> let's get on to that, because it is actually a fantastically competitive business. You're, yeah. you're, you're, you're a, a, not a big community, but you're a very competitive community. Yeah, so are, how there, does that work? There are about 200 Herdwick farmers. A bit, basically, what's By going on... By the way, on. just a little interruption. One of your pictures, remind us who that is. That's, that's Floss, who I think you've been calling the most famous sheepdog in the world. Yeah. She's, she's doing all right, this Floss. Floss had puppies in... Um, Did anybody well, see uh, any of uh, James's vines of uh, the puppies, which, were, which got... 650,000 people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How weird is that? Anyway. Who, who knew? Uh, but, uh, We'll yeah. come back to the dogs. But. So, so where was it? Sorry, what's basically going on is, you know when we were downstairs looking at the sheep, lots of you had to look at the sheep. If you can breed a sheep that lives for two years longer than your average sheep, okay, that's maybe worth £10 per ewe. Okay? If a ram breeds 100 daughters in its lifetime and they're worth £10 more a ewe, then he's worth £1,000 more than the average. right? Which means that his father, if he breeds 10 sons that can do that, is worth £10,000. And the minute you've got 10,000 pound rams, somebody's breeding one that fathers 10,000 pounds. So there's a kind of pyramid thing happens. At the bottom, yes, it's about meat. Yes, it's about wool. Yes, it's about commercial activity. Uh, but in each of the breeds, in each of the areas, there's a sort of pinnacle. And at the top, you have these handful of elite flocks that, that breed the super special stuff that can change everybody else's flocks and make them better. And that's what we're trying to do. That's what Joe's all about downstairs. That's what William, who's 20 years old, dreams have been about. That's what he's trying to work towards. And that's what we're about. And, uh, and it's absolutely ruthless because you either do breed them good enough to be at the top of that pinnacle or you fall away and your standards drop and nobody cares. And, no, and, and where, where, where is that judged? Who judges that? It's judged, um, uh, it's judged in a superficial way at some sort of shows that we have in the autumn called Shepherd's Meets where in each of the valleys there's a competitive uh, gathering of shepherds. They all bring their best sheep and we all do our thing and... Uh, show them off, and to win the shepherds meet in your valley is is to earn the bragging rights, basically, over your fellow shepherds for the next year. And then you go to a show called Eskdale, although we would call it Eshtel. Um We don't say anything properly. <laughs> and that's the sort of championship for the whole Lake District. And uh, there's a guy called Anthony Hartley, who's probably the best breeder, or has been the best breeder for the last 20 years. And if you're 50 or under, as I am, thankfully still, uh, um, you're basically trying to be the next Anthony Hartley. You're trying to beat him. He is the... You're trying to you knock know. him off his throne, basically. He's, he's yeah. the main shepherd in the late mm. district. And don't tell him I said this, but last autumn was the first autumn that um, he didn't win a still show because I won the U championship. Yes! Uh, and, yes. <laughs> and, and Joe downstairs won the male championship and went on to win the overall championship. And so who decides that there are judges there? There uh, is a judge who's basically chosen because he's one of the elders in the breed and he's... Very, he's um, very, very knowledgeable. Sometimes they're not right, but we have to mm. smart, grin and bear it. Um, so, so, yeah, there's this whole sort of cultural, cultural crazy thing going on, which I, we just did and never thought about for mm. most of my life. And then I think I've got older, and in that last 10 years, I, I just feel like I want to tell people that that's what we do and that people should see it and that that's actually what we're all about and that's what happens in that landscape. And, and I, think, I think it's partly because... You watch amazing TV documentaries, don't you, about like, people that herd reindeers in Laponia, or you see these amazing like landscape cultures around the world. And I've been watching those programs for like ten years, thinking we do stuff like that. No, why does nobody talk about us doing stuff like that? Why, why does nobody see it? Why don't we tell the 16 million people a year that come to the Lake District? So part of my motivation was I sort of woke up and saw what we were, um, sort of saw it in the round and thought, I want to, I want to tell everybody about this. And, uh, yeah. and, it, and then we've got a room full of people who've come because I wrote a book about it, so it's, it's all very nice. And yeah. let's just talk a bit, uh, you, 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 you said, what, what was the average income for 8,000 8, a year? I mean, yeah. some people would say, um, you're wasting your time. Brutal yeah. people would say, yeah. you know, why, why are you doing this? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's just not economically viable. Yeah, but we know who those people are. They're the mm. Harvard Business School people that mm. tried to bankrupt the world in 2007, mm. 2008. And they've got... They're, but, yeah. but actually, the Thank interesting you. thing is... They've, when, got, when, sorry, when, when, they've, when, got, ah, they've got lousy values. They've got lousy values, and they've tried to make everybody else have lousy values, and I despise those values, and I don't think we should judge the world like that. But sorry. interesting...
That's, that's an easy round of applause, but I'm going to reveal something now that you told me that actually you thought a bit like that when you were about 20. Yeah. You thought... You, I, thought, you were quite, I, you thought I thought it was all screwed, and I thought we should see the world like that, and I would have described myself as a neoliberal. Mm. And I, I read books by Friedrich Hayek, and I, I, even uh, I was looking at Mark here, because I went to a college with Mark, but I won an essay competition... Uh, an international essay competition when I was at university, and it, I'm a Friedrich Hayek Memorial Scholar, which is now, <laughs> which is now hilarious, because I, I don't agree with half that stuff, but um, yeah, that's what I thought. And then I, I think like lots of other people, I'm kind of radicalized by the last 10, 15 years. I look at what's happening in the world, and I think, actually, my granddad lived better than, the, you know, we, we did some things all right. Why don't, I think I want to look at my grandfather and how he lived, and I think there's lots of, there's more I can learn from him in many ways than you can learn from those other ideas that we're supposed to live by and we're supposed to judge things by. And I don't think people want to. People, are, people haven't come out like this um, to listen to me talk, sort of spout neoliberal stuff, have they? They've come because they care about where the food comes from and what their landscape looks like and the places that they go on holiday looks like. And they want to trust where their food comes from. Um, none of this is my original to, to me, but people responding to that, aren't they? And it's not just cheap applause, it's because they genuinely care, isn't it? Yeah. Let's spool back, because what you've revealed now is that although you left school having... Did you, did you flunk your GCSEs or did you not even do them? Uh, I didn't do some of them and I flunked others and I got right. a C in woodwork and a C in G, uh, religious, religious studies. You're rubbish at woodwork, yeah. 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 I, was, um, I was amazed because I was trying to flunk woodwork and I still got C. <laughs> but but the, I mean, the, thing, the, the joke in the book was that my grandfather said I should be a vicar because I could do the service and then I could build the coffin, which I was like... <laughs> So how come, uh, having left school at 15, 16, um, you've, uh, you've got yourself quite a high quality education? Yeah. For those people who respect Oxford. <laughs> no, no. Well, let me explain, and then we'll actually yeah. explain that I respect Oxford ultimately. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I worked at home for nine years, worked on the farm, and two things happened basically. A, I was starting to believe those ideas that we were talking about a moment ago. So I'm yeah. looking at my farm thinking, well, maybe we should just stop. Maybe there isn't any future in this. Mm. Maybe the market forces are trying to tell us something. Because it must have been hard to get, I mean... Oh, lousy. Yeah, I got, yeah. I got, for nine years I worked at home and I got paid £40 pounds a week. And that yeah. isn't even rare. Lots of farm lads work yeah. at home. They, they live at home and they eat well and they drive their dad's car or whatever. Yeah. So they probably look like they're doing okay, but they're getting paid pocket money. And yeah. I did. Um, but... And also, I had a, uh, my dad died in February, and we ended up best mates for the last 10 or 15 years. But when I was 20, we had a horrible relationship where we were just butting heads. It was a small farm, and there's two mm. big egos, and we're dunching heads every day. Uh, and it got a bit nasty, and I, I sort of didn't know what to do, but I sort of, uh, I sort of had an escape plan, really. And the escape plan was my younger sisters turned out to be really clever. They went for interviews at Oxford and Cambridge and other places and uh, did great in their exams. And I... Uh, I used to help them with, because I was bookish, I used to help them with like their history So you'd homework. always been a, a yeah. big reader? I, I had absolutely no doubt ever that I was reasonably with it, because that, that we, we respect in our family people being smart, but just a sort of practical farm or business smart. So mm. I, never, I never had any lack of confidence about that at all. Um, but anyway, I, uh, to cut a long story short, I went back and did evening classes um, uh, at nights after I was working on the farm. And... I've got the craziest CV ever because it reads GCSE, C in woodwork, C in religious studies, A levels. I think I'd done one. Uh, and then I had this amazing uh, tutor at Adult Education College, and he said, You should apply to go to Oxford. What was it? Uh, was he an English teacher? He was or? a history teacher. Right. Uh, just a really cool bloke. Um, and I applied, and I think I, I think I applied for the year after. So I was like going this autumn. So you'd gone back to do A-levels? Yeah, basically. gone back to do A-levels. I was just starting those A-levels. So I think I'd done one, and then I decided I would do two or three more, and that was going to take me another year. Mm. So um, I applied to Oxford. I went for an interview, which I think I'm right in saying was for the following year. And then... You went for an interview in Oxford? Yeah, I had a fantastic round with about three history tutors who, who, who seemed to be really bored when I went in the room, but when I came out, we were having like a complete humdinger of a row about something. <laughs> Uh, and I came out... So, and, and you, 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 I mean, were you widely travelled at... What, what, no, what I, age I, were you, 20, 20? I hadn't been anywhere, really. Um, I was in my early 20s. So I was, uh, frankly, I was half terrified. I was like, what am I doing here? I don't mm. know, I haven't been anywhere, I don't speak any languages, I can't play any musical instruments. It seemed like everybody else there did do all those things. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know much stuff about history. I'd like, and I 
I could talk about history, you know, talk about books and stuff, so I didn't really worry about that. And I didn't really feel like I had anything to lose because I wasn't sure I wanted to go. So I just thought, okay, well, if you're not bothered, swing for it, you know, have a go. Um, and they sent me a letter like about like three days later saying I had an unconditional offer, um, which is crazy. Don't come next year, come this year, drop the, drop the A-levels, which I'd only just started. <laughs> Uh, and this was at the time, there was like a big Laura Spence scandal about some girl who'd got like nine A's Amazing. and she didn't get in and I'd got no A's and I got in I was like, oh. <laughs> So I was, I was like, what the hell is going on? Um, and I still didn't know what I wanted to go. So I said to my dad, like, what, am I supposed to go and do this? He's like, you better bloody add. Um, so I went and um, anyway, to, to cut to the chase on this, I'm not, I... I was very disrespectful of education when I was 15. I'm not now. I realize how lucky you are to go to an amazing university. You get tutors that spend an hour with you twice a week or whatever it is. Amazing people. I mean, that's a ridiculous privilege to have and it gives you loads of advantages and it gives you confidence to be smart and be open about it. So I'm not, I'm not at all disrespectful about that. I feel very lucky about it. I think it's a shame that that's getting more and more difficult to access for people from different... different or, Backgrounds. Because they, they took a punt on you. That was, that was yeah. quite a radical move, wasn't it? Yeah, I think they were just um, amused. <laughs> um, but I had, a, I had amazing tutors. And actually, I want to do a plug while I'm here. There's a guy called Nick Stargat, who's my history tutor, who's spent the last 10 years writing a, ever since then, writing a social history of Germany in the Second World War. And Nick Stargat is an absolute legend. I have utmost respect for him, and his book's coming out soon, and you should probably try and buy it. <laughs> there you go, Nick. That's a play. Yeah. yeah. M maybe you can put an endorsement on the back, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But he was, um, to be fair, those people, um, I think the things like the, that I've done, like the book, wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for people like that. So the, what did they teach me? What, sort of just to be me, and then it was okay. And, so, and, sorry, you, you it sounds a bit cheesy, but mm. I, think, I think I thought you played the game by pretending to be like everybody else there, mm. and in a period of a few weeks of getting there, they said, no, no, you've got this wrong. We didn't let you in to be like them. Mm we want you to be you and and then I had a lot of fun I was just me opinionated and ch chippy and northern and, ki <laughs> and kicking off and it worked all right so. you might have thought you know uh, extraordinary life story there you, you you go to Oxford uh, you get a degree yeah. and that would be bye-bye farming well I went um I was a bit mercenary a bit of me was th still thinking I'll do whatever I have to do to make loads of money the, the ultimate goal was to go home I wanted to be the lad that went back and lived where he wanted to you be. You always thought you, this yeah. wasn't a, a, no, no, a means a, of escape. No, no, it was a sort of mercenary thing. I thought, I was looking at the people in the villages who were coming in and buying the houses, and I thought, well, I, I'm, I'm a million miles away from being able to buy a house where I want to live, to live in this place. Um, I'll do whatever those people do. So I would have worked in a Wall Street bank. I would have done anything. There's a period of about six months where I was entirely mercenary. Uh, luckily, I failed every interview I went for. So, um, <laughs> So, so did you have an interview to I be had a banker? A, I, I had an interview at Accenture. You might have been one of those people who helped bring yeah. down the financial system. Well, thank God for that. I, wasn't, <laughs> I went for an interview at Accenture where you had to do one of these tasks about, you know, when there's like, you're all at one side of the river and you have a bunch of, tasks, a bunch of tools. Um, and it was like, how do you get to the far side of the river? And how do you get the sheep across the river? And you yeah. had no idea. No, it was a sort of boat and a rope <laughs> and there were six of you and you had to work out how to get to the far side of the river. And I swear to God, I've never been in a room with more obnoxious people in my whole life. <laughs> and, and all I could think about was, I'll drown three of them. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't get. Is that not the right answer? No, apparently not. So that was the end of me being mercenary. Um, so um, yeah. So and I lived in Oxford with my wife, and she quite liked living in Oxford. And she's a bit more cosmopolitan than me. She would have done all sorts of things. But I just wanted to go home. I was going home a lot of weekends and a lot of nights, and I was going home all the summer. I mean, you only have three, week, three eight week terms. I was at home for most of it. I went to Oxford, and nobody could believe it because I was at, back in Cumbria for most of the year. Um, and I just wanted to be back there. But I, frankly, it looked, looked a bit of a dodgy strategy because, like you say, you're supposed to go to the city, you know, go and work in the city or become a blah, whatever. And my strategy appeared to be go straight back home or work on a farm, um, which is a bit dumb. Um, but yeah. You and you, so you, you, you go back home, and what, is your farming life changed by the fact that you've come back from Oxford? With um, a degree, I think the most fundamental thing that changed was I came. Uh, I just grown up a bit, you know. You, hopefully, I grown up a bit. So I came how does that help you when you're getting uh, up at five thirty uh, or whatever? Well, to you, go think, you think that's hard, but that's not that hard. Loads of these people will get up at. You, I bet you get up at six o'clock all the time did, to go yes, and do yes, hard yes. things. You'd be on trains all day. Mm. Everybody works hard. Nearly mm. everybody works hard. Um, I don't think the, the work's that hard. The um, 
I think how it helped was I was, uh, when I went back, my relationship with my dad was fine, and uh, I did other, other, other work around the farm, and I had my own money for the first time, so there wasn't like the pressure about money from a small farm. I could just farm because I wanted to. I could just work all weekend on the farm because I wanted to. Um, so that just made it easier, basically. And, and my dad, uh, and although my dad's the least academic person ever, um, he respected the fact that I'd been and I'd done another thing and I was doing my best. So. Uh, and how has the farm developed since then? I mean, um, is it in the, in the same state? It was, I mean, it's obviously precarious, but is it, is it less precarious? Um, it's, it's tricky. I mean, to be, per to be perfectly honest, um, both my dad, I think for much of his life, and myself for quite a lot of my life, have felt like failures because we measured ourselves against my grandfather who seemed like he made more money than we did, basically, and was doing better. He was the one that had bought the farm. And, it, mm. and you sort of personalise it. You look at that person and you think, How, why aren't we doing well? Mm. You know, why aren't we buying a farm and things? Um, what I've realised when you grow up is that my granddad lived in the 1950s when there were lots of subsidies flying around for farmers just to produce things. Uh, land was cheap. Um, uh, it was a particular moment, and, and if you look at the longer history of farming in the latest, the small, farms, small farmers nearly always did other things. Mm. So I thought I was a bit of an aberration until recently, you know, I write stuff on my computer and do other work. But the truth is, people that have farms like ours have always done other things. They split slate, they work in the mines, they, they always did other things, and I think it's going back to that. If you have a, quite a big farm like Joda's, um, you'll just farm 24-7. Uh, if you have a smaller farm like we do, then you, you'll juggle it with other things to bring money in. And in the quiet parts of the year, you'll go off the, fa go off the farm and do other things. So that's, so that's how it's changed. It's, it's changed from a sort of 1950s, slightly false thing. Has it become sustainable? I mean, it, do farmers have to be more realistic and say, we're going to do B&B, &B, we're going to do, you know, come and enjoy the farm experience, we're going to do yeah, a bit we, of this and a bit of that? They definitely do. They definitely do that you just can't sit still or you're going to die, basically. Um, so we, we do a thing where pr primary schools come to the farm. So my wife's been at home today, Helen. We've had 66 kids on the farm today, and they, came, uh, they sometimes come to learn about food, sometimes about different habitats on the farm. And uh, we do that. We don't charge very much, but we charge the schools a little bit to come to the farm. So that brings in another source of income. And I, uh, although I'm super keen on sheep, uh, I'm also uh, I'm quite interested in conservation and wildlife. So... You've got another life, haven't you, off yeah, the farm? Yeah, I have, but we, we try, uh, the other way that the farm's changing is we, we're trying to do quite a lot of conservation things around the farm, so we've planted hundreds of trees and fenced off all the rivers, and um, yeah, there's more wildlife than there used to be on the farm, is the truth of the matter. There's, there's a pair of barn owls in a nest box that we put up a couple of years ago, and yeah, and I think that's fair enough. I think people, the truth is everybody in this room, uh, pay it, some of their taxes go to subsidise farming in hill, hill areas, mm. And I think they have every right to, you have every right to expect that we do it in an environmentally, socially responsible way and that uh, it's good for wildlife and it's good for people to access, et cetera. So we try, I try to take that challenge on. I want to move on to how um, I got to know about you and, and probably these people got to know about you and, and you came to write the book, um, which was, uh, I, I've, got a, I've got a confession to make. I do a, a sort of presentation about the state of technology, and the whole thing starts with a picture of you. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, did, I did this presentation at a bank, and the, the chap set, set, sent it back to me and said, why have you put a picture of a man with a sheep at the beginning of this presentation? It's got nothing to do with the future of technology. And I said, this is, this is a guy who marries the old and the new. So tell us about how you started um, on the social media trail. The, the truth is, that the truth is, I've always been interested in sort of communicating what we do. So even from when I was at Oxford, I used to write for magazines. Um, and when the foot and mouth epidemic was on, I wrote a series of features for some magazines that made loads of people cry, apparently. But um, and the bit in the book apparently makes everyone cry as well. But um, so I'd always written, and I was one of those people that hadn't quite got around to writing the book that they wanted to. Um, and then had some friends challenged me to tweet from the farm, and I wasn't remotely interested. I thought, oh, it's, it's just people like that, Rory Ketlin-Jones and <laughs> Kim Kasabian rabbiting on about her breasts and a bottom and all that sort of stuff. So, um, uh, James, stop. Kardashian, I yeah, think. Kardashian, whatever. 
<laughs> who cares? Um, so I thought that's what it was. And um, anyway, so as a bit of an experiment, I, I opened up the Herdy Shepherd Twitter yeah. account, then realized I'd locked myself out and lost the password. So I, <laughs> so I opened another account, well, which is Herdy <laughs> Shepherd 1. Dead slick. I'm dead good at technology. Um, and I started putting pictures up pictures on what we're doing on the farm. And it basically had some simple rules, which is, it's not about me, so I never ever appear yeah, in Yeah, I didn't know what your name was. Until yeah, I was, in fact, I was anonymous for the first two years. Yeah, yeah. Nobody believes me now. They think I'm a complete tart because I do things like this. So. <laughs> but the truth is, I, I wanted to get the message across, not get me across. That wasn't really what I'm about. Um, uh, so I, I there, was, there was a... There was a very heavy winter where there were uh, uh, yeah. there's a lot of snow yeah. and you had quite a difficult time. And, and that was yeah. that when it really took off? The, yeah, the it, it, it took off then. So we were d d uh, digging sheep out of snowdrifts, basically, trying to get them back down to the lower ground away from where it was dangerous. And uh, like all good, good things, it, it happened by accident. So I'm, I'm basically, I've got, I have a bag of feed in my hands and I'm persuading this flock of sheep to come with me through the snow, through a sn snowdrift. It's quite dangerous. And, um, While holding your iPhone. Yeah. No, 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 I wasn't. <laughs> Phone's safely away in my pocket. Then I fall on my backside, trip over a stone in the snow, and the sheep are like coming through the channel I'd done over the snow towards me. And uh, at that point, I thought, oh, that looks good. So I pulled out my phone, took a picture, and put that on uh, Twitter. And yeah, that kind of went mad. I had a few thousand. That was getting about 2,000 retweets an hour at one point. And the, the American news networks and things picked it up. Um, and that went kind of mad. And then. Uh, I won't bore you with it too much, but the story of the book is uh, one of the people that saw that was a guy called Alexis Madrigal at Atlantic Monthly in America, the editor. And you, The Atlantic was yeah. a, a magazine that you knew about and yeah, admired? Yeah, I, 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 um, one of the things I used to do to make my time in Oxford more bearable was I used to get all copies of Life magazine or Atlantic Monthly out of their Bodleian and I would just look at like whatever Hemingway was writing in the 50s and 60s. So Atlantic Monthly to me is like sort of holy words. I was like, wow. And so then they rang me up and said, would you like to write a piece about why you tweet and what, what this is all about? And the truth is, I absolutely shamelessly thought, oh, wow, Hemingway wrote for them. Let's show off. <laughs> yeah. Let's do the best thousand words I've ever done in my life. Um, so I, I sat down and sent it off. And um, yeah, to cut a long story very short, that led to agents and uh, publishers and other people saying, would, can you write a book? And the, the bloody hilarious bit is I had half a book. Uh, sitting in a drawer from about 10 years earlier before I started having kids and farming and all sorts of things. Um, so, yeah, I was like, not only can I write a book, but I've got half a book, you know, I've got half a book. Can we do it right now? Um, and then I just got, I really looked out after that because I, uh, I got signed up by Penguin and I've got an amazing uh, editor called Helen Comford and I've just got, the, quite a lot of them are here. I've got the coolest group of people uh, ever working with me and trying to make what I do better. Um, so, yeah, it's all gone kind of mad. And would, would any of that have happened without, without that technology? In, in a way, would people have known about you without Twitter? I really want to say that it doesn't matter, but mm. I suspect it. No, I, I, think it's, I think the truth is the Twitter thing has helped me enormously. Mm. So it's, I think it does two things. It builds you, I'm going to sound a bit authory now, but it kind of builds you an audience. If you've got, yeah. I'm really lucky, I've got 67,000 people follow me on Twitter. And a good chunk of those have gone out and bought a book that I wrote, for which I'll always be grateful. Um, so you have a head start on somebody that doesn't have the 67,000 followers. And then I think something else happens, which is probably as powerful, which is people like yourself and other, what, what do you call it, opinion formers, people in the media. Hacks. Hacks, whatever. <laughs> uh, people of influence in the media, they follow it. And that helps enormously, I think, because you knew about my book and, mm. and mm. followed the story and are interested. So. And let's... We're going to stop quite soon because these people have got all sorts of complicated questions about the difference between I, a herd I and a keep looking, yeah. I keep looking thinking, who have you come to see? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you, you have got, uh, I mean, it's, it's an amazing book and it's, um, it's an emotional book and it's, it gives you a real feeling of, of, of the life uh, in the Lake District. But you, you've got a message there, haven't you, which you're, you're quite serious about. Tell us what that message is. I think there might be a few. In fact, my editor, Helen Comfort, would say there's too many, maybe. But, um, um, well, I, I particularly want people to care about what I think of as, as the real Lake District, the sort of the stuff that's really happening in the landscape that makes it what it is. So that was one of the things I wanted to get across. But I think there are other... Um, in a way, who cares what happened to me at school? It doesn't really matter. It's ancient history. But I, I really find it sad what still happens in school to loads of kids that are like me that aren't connecting to what's going on there, don't think it's about them. And... Uh, and there are a bunch of other messages about 
food, food, food for about example. food. I'm yeah. really, really passionate about food. I think there's, uh, we're all super busy, aren't we? I'm not pointing the finger at anyone. Everyone's super busy and everyone's time poor and supermarkets make it just way too easy to go and not care where the food came from, not care what happened to the producer. And, and that convenience is hugely helpful and that's why people go into supermarkets. But uh, we've, we've let ourselves get really detached from the effect of it. So we, I'm not going to whinge about my own situation, but like dairy farmers at the moment, it costs uh, really good, responsible and quite large scale and official dairy farmers tell me that it costs 30 pence a litre to produce milk in this country. And they, they're getting offered contracts of 14 to 16 pence a litre at the moment, which is, um, which is you know, I, I hesitate to use the word criminal, it's just really awful. And you have people that have done um, everything that's asked of them in terms of modernising, becoming more efficient, being more env environmentally responsible, etc. Uh, and there's just way too much power and way too few hands in the food chain. And so, yeah, I don't want to bore you all with the politics of it, but I, I care really deeply about that. And I just, in however small a way, quite like trying to get that message across and trying to get people to think. I don't think there are any easy answers. If there were, people would have come up with them long ago. But I think the more people we can get to care about um, uh, the effects of their buying choices and their food choices, the better. And... That's why it's a bit of a thrill when you see all you guys coming and seeing like two Herdwick sheep in Notting Hill and, <laughs> and buying my book and things like that. It's, it's, it's nice because it says to me that I was wrong when I was 20, that people do care. They care deeply about this stuff. And we're all part of the problem and we're all ultimately can be part of the solution. The one thing I did learn from neoliberals when I was one is that uh, you hear people on the news, uh, forgive me for criticising the news, but people on the news talk about market forces as if it's like a machine or a monster or something. It isn't, as you well know with your wife's an economist. Market forces is what we choose to do, and if we choose to do something else in supermarkets and we choose to do something else with our weekly grocery bill, then market forces change and you get a different outcome. I was just thinking the other day, the two, when I was a kid, it was common to smoke and it was common to not wear a seatbelt. Now, ev hardly anybody smokes and everybody wears a seatbelt. You can change things with public policy and you can change things by changing hearts and minds and educating people. And, and I'm not going to do that. I'm not Jamie Oliver. I don't have that level of influence and power. But Oh, wait a minute. But, you can, but, <laughs> you, but we can all do a bit, can't we? We can all do a bit. And that, I suppose my bit is to try and write a book and to try and do things like this and draw attention to it. So just to give you a, a very real example of it, uh, when I was a kid, uh, the cost of doing a caesarean for a sheep that's lambing, okay, so you have a sheep, it's lambing, you can't lamb them itself, uh, you know it needs a caesarean. You're going to take it to the vet. Um, uh, when the sheep was worth, in real terms, £400, you spent £75 or £100 on a caesarean because a sheep has a certain value and it's worthwhile looking after it. Now, uh, the sheep's worth £75 and the caesarean costs £150. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So you're up a field and, and, frankly, I'd like to tell you that always you take it to the vets and you make a loss on it, but not all farmers do because they're going broke. So people having to make crappy decisions that are not in the interest of animal welfare because of that cheapening of food and cheapening of... Um, no easy answers to it. No, yeah, there, you've got no, easy no there aren't any easy answers to it. And be, you could go for sort of cheap claps and things, and I'm not doing that. It's difficult, and there's lots of good things about supermarkets, but um, I think people need to know that stuff. They need to know that if you buy that milk at whatever it is, four, four pints for a pound, that's what you're doing. You're basically voting for 5,000 cows in a herd Sorry, just a simple, some of you will know this already. If you have up to 200 cows in a dairy herd, you can walk them down the road and you can put them into a field, okay? Once you pass 300, 400 cows, when you take them down the field on a rainy day, they make six acres of mud getting into the field. So if you have 5,000 cows, they don't go outside, okay? So you, yeah, they never go outside. They live in a shed and you cut the grass into them, okay? Now that's all right. You can actually look after, you can look after cows in a shed with a relatively high degree of animal welfare. But I frankly would rather cows went outside. And what's happening is everybody's picking up the four pints for a pound and not realising that they're actually voting for 5,000 cow herds. There's a sort of mismatch where we're not told what we need to know. Sorry, I've gone a bit serious, haven't I? Sorry, everybody. Uh, I think you've given us a, a fantastic um, overview of your life and of your passion about the industry. If there's... If there's cause I'm, about to open the question, if there's one message you'd like people to take from your book, then what would you sum it up as? Oh, one message. That's tough. Um, By the book, <laughs> yes. No, I, that's nice, but no, the truth is, it isn't that. Sorry, Penguin. Um, I think it's the thinking more about your shopping thing. 
and I try to do it, and we don't get it right. We do some of the things you all do, but um, I think I'd like people just to think a bit more about those traditional farming practices here and elsewhere. And I know it's a pain in the ass because you have to go to another shop sometimes or you have to spend more and you don't exactly know why you're spending more and all that. Um, but I think, I just think, think about it as much as you can and do as much as you can with your grocery spend to, to sort of create a food chain that you like rather than one you don't like. And that'll be different for all of you. You make your own sort of different ethical choices on that. James Rivers, thank you very much indeed. A little round of applause before we get to questions. And there's going to be, there's going to be the infamous ro roaming mic. I'm going to do the David Dimbleby, the man in the, in the woolly jumper with the green beard on the left. Um, so put your hands up. This lady here. what could be done to help people who maybe are living quite close to the breadline themselves and making what you and I'm sure most people in this room would agree are rotten choices about what to buy. Yep. Is there anything you can see that could be done that would make it possible for people to make those ethical choices? This is going back to your no, no, um, I, I, economic days. And it is going back to my... <laughs> the, the truth is we don't pay people enough... We don't pay people fair wages, do we? We've got a cheap wage society and, and, and to, to make it sort of screwed up and grind people down to where they're living on poverty wages and then want to do something with food to solve it, it's kind of the wrong way around. I think, I want to sound like bloody Karl Marx in a minute, but they, uh, that, that's the problem, isn't it? I can't tell you there's a magical solution when people are having to live on 60 quid a week or something. There isn't a magical solution. Those people need to buy what they need to buy to feed their kids. I, I, who am I to judge? Um, uh, so I think, it, uh, sadly, I think it's about big complicated things like inequality in our society and, and how we pay people at the bottom. I'm not going to solve that one, am I? But that's what not I Not in the next 30 seconds, no. Um, uh, there's, a, there's one up there. Um, <laughs> my my three-year-old son, Isaac, is the most sheep-obsessed three-year-old you have ever <laughs> seen in your life. Um, but that doesn't mean he'll still be sheep obsessed when he's older. Um, Would you like them to be? I think I'd, I'd, if they want to, I'd be, I'd be genuinely delighted if one of them chooses to do it, whether it's one of the girls or... They have what... I mean, I, I only saw it for, for a few hours in a sort of, uh, on, a, on a, a pleasant April morning, and it looked sort of idyllic, and they, they looked like they were having a great time, but... It's not always like that. No, I, exactly. I, I, went, I went into my daughter's bedroom the other night, Molly, she's nine, and um, they'd done a thing at school where they had to tell their friend something great about them and then tell them something bad about them. And I said, okay, let's play that game. And I told her like two lovely things about her. Um, and then I said, and she said, well, I'll tell you two bad things about you. <laughs> um, and I said, what's that? And she said, um, you get really cross when you're getting sheep out of fields and we're running around. Can you not get quite so cross? So I, like, oh. <laughs> so I felt about that big. Uh, but no, it's, the, point, the point is it isn't always... Um, it isn't always idyllic. I think my best grown-up answer to your question is, I don't actually need them to be farmers. I, I really hope they grow up to be smart, and I really hope they know where they came from and that they care about some of the things that I care about, uh, but on their, own t on their own terms, basically. And if that means they choose to farm, then I'll be delighted. If they're just smart, happy, healthy, well-adjusted people doing other things, that's okay, too. Um, I'm, I'm lucky, particularly through the book and things, I've now got loads of friends who do other things, and that is not during my life isn't second rate, is it? It's just people have other interests, other lives, uh, and that, that's all right. And I can, I can see my kids having other lives, and that would be all right as well. Is there a... Hi. Um, I just want to ask a question about um, the judging that you mentioned earlier yeah. and how that relates to your livelihood. Um, so if you take a, a you or a ram or a, a tup or a tip to, to, the, to the market um, and, and show it off, how does it relate... Because it's an aesthetic choice for the judge in a way. If it's got bright eyes and big balls, you know, he's going to say, yep. hooray. But, like, how much is it scientific? Because if it's going to equate to you making 10 grand for yeah. a sheep that yeah. produces that many ewes, aren't they going to take blood tests of it? Or it's just too... But, that, that's a good question. And I've been asking it for ages. I keep asking scientists, can you tell me that that one's better than that one? Uh, the truth is, no, you can't. There's an amazing uh, animal, 
Anne Plant geneticist called Diana Bowles, who happens to breed Herdwick sheep, and she's a, fr <laughs> she's a friend of mine. And I was saying to her, Diana, can you do something sciencey science with the blood of that sheep to tell me it's better than that one? No, the answer is they can't. There are, she, she tells me that in the DNA of sheep, there are greater differences between individuals in the same breed than there are between some in different breeds. What I'm trying to say is they can't tell you which one's going to come with better teeth. They can't tell you which ones uh, are going to be a little bit longer or which ones and, are going to be more natural. Remind us why better teeth are important. Uh, better teeth are important because if you had to live on a mountain and your teeth start to become too long or they fall out, your days are numbered. You'll start to not get enough nutrition and you'll start to die. Because so, uh, what we didn't talk about was how much time they spend, yeah. uh, not on your farm, but up on the fowl. And yeah. on a particular part of the fell? Yeah. Um, Herdwick, uh, Herdwick sheep are basically native to the Lake District. Most of you will know that if you've been following on Twitter and things. But uh, the sheep that came with the Vikings, they live in the Lake District fells. They live nearly all of the year in the, in, on the common land in the mountains, on the fells. And they, there are multiple flocks up there and there aren't fences. So the sheep live on a particular part of the mountain and they're what we call hefted, which basically means that um, their mothers taught them to live on a certain part of the mountain, not just anywhere or roam all over the place, uh, but to live on that specific part of the fell. So even though there are no fences and there are 10 flocks on our mountain, I can go to the mountain with my dogs and I could get 90% of my sheep without too much trouble from one particular part of the mountain um, just because they're hefted. So, uh, and that's quite unique. And uh, the other thing I've learned as I've got older and uh, slightly more radical in the last 10 years is I love what happened in the Lake District landscape, which is the fells are privately owned. You might not like that, but lots of the fells are privately owned by, in many cases, the descendants of the person that was the Lord of the Manor, okay? Now, I don't like that very much, but uh, they have almost no rights on their own mountains because their peasants won. It was considered to be manorial waste, so scrubland, and they let us on many, many centuries ago, thousands of years ago. And the deal was uh, we could graze their mountains that they didn't value very much, but whenever we went to war with the Scots, we had to carry a... P pretend we were interested and um, <laughs> troop off up the road to Scotland and occasionally run back with our tails between our legs. But they, uh, about 17, 1700, they, we rebelled basically. They said, okay, come and fight the Scots. And we all said, no, I don't think we will. So we kept the rights to graze the mountain, which is a legal right that you can buy, sell, rent, uh, inherit um, on their land. So there's this marvelous thing where my, the mountain that I graze on belongs technically to somebody else, but that person has no grazing rights on the mountain. Um, you or anybody else in this room can walk over it because it's sort of right to roam or free access. And they can do almost nothing on their own mountain, which I just think is was fantastically <laughs> botched English sort of little revolution, isn't it? It's like the peasants won and you can't do anything about it. So I, I, kind, of, I kind of love that. It's typically English and messy and botched, but it's good. Oh, a question at the back. In your book, you describe the lights being out in, in the valley next to you because of the second homers. How do you reconcile the Lake District's need for the income that comes from tourism yeah. with the way you would like it to be and, and a vibrant community yeah. still? Because the one appears to leech off the other. Great book, by the way. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, that, the truth is, a, a tiny minority of people have read, read the book as being sort of highly critical of tourism, but I think it isn't. I think at the start, I'm really clear that one of the reasons that we survived doing this quite old-fashioned thing is that nearly all of us are diversified and have been for 200-odd years into tourism. We have B&Bs, we have campsites, we do other things. So one of the... It's a very old story about diversification, basically. There are 16 million people a year come to the Lake District. They spend 1.2 billion a year. It employs like 40,000 people, way more than farming employs. So if you've got kids like I have, you know that if they're going to live in our area, they're more likely to be going to work in tourism than farming. I, I'm not anti-tourism is what I'm trying to say. Um, I think what I am... As long as they don't let their dogs out. Well, as long as they don't let their dogs out, yeah, because that causes absolute chaos. And um, the, the truth is I'm not anti-tourism. I just want a slightly better kind of tourism. I would like a tourism, not just where I live, but all around the world, that's a little bit more aware of the people it's visiting, a little bit more aware of the culture of those people. Uh, not just for their sake, but I think it makes the place more interesting. So I get, I get like really, really lovely messages on Twitter from people that have been coming to the Lake District for all their lives, and then saying that they see it differently, and you just think, oh, wow, wow, I love that, I love that. And they're, and they're seeing stuff that they haven't seen before, and they think it's more interesting. 
So I don't want everyone to go away. I don't want everyone not to come. I, I just like a slightly more respectful, slightly more tuned in tourism. I think there was a question right at the front here. Thank you. Um, are you still learning new techniques and are you becoming more efficient? Ah, oh, are you a better shepherd? Um, uh, the, the straight answer is yes. You basically never ever stop learning as a shepherd. It's like a, I'm, uh, I was, I was going to say I'm in the juniors, that's not strictly true. I'm in the sort of intermediate class basically. Uh, the people who think they really know what they're doing are about 30 years, 40 years older than me. Um, uh, one of the things I love about England is you, uh, sorry, love about London and cities is you go into rooms with all sorts of smart people that are in their twenties or whatever who are on top of their game, brilliant at what they do. To be honest, shepherding in the Lake District isn't like that. You 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 kind of earn your spurs really really slowly until you're 70, 80, 70 odd years old, and you've uh, you've done what you do a very long time and sticking at it's part of what's respected. Um, so uh, I I've been lucky enough to have some quite good sheep and to do some things reasonably well. But as my neighbour, who's 30-odd years older than me, keeps telling me, it doesn't really count. You've got to keep doing it for like another... Th she said to me the other day, I'll be impressed when you've done that for another 38 years. <laughs> okay? And I love that. That's like, I like that. That's part of why I wanted the Twitter thing to be anonymous. I don't, really don't think I'm that important in that thing. Uh, it's nice to be part of something where you're just doing your best to keep it going and that everybody else around you is doing their best to keep it going. And none of you individually are that important, but collectively it's nice and it's... How, how do you compare with your grandfather? At what? <laughs> um, everybody thinks I'm like my grandfather. My grandfather was um, hopefully quite a good, I think it was fair to say he was a good farmer. Um, but he was, um, he was quite good company as well. I mean, he, he did slightly off the wall things as well. Like he, uh, he used to train out of his farmyard in the 60s and 70s, some racehorses. And I used to find him amazing because we'd go to little northern r national hunt race course tracks and he'd be talking to like some farmer from down the road from our farm, and then he'd turn round and he'd be chatting to like Lord Cavendish or the Queen Mother's trainer or something. I was like, how the hell do you know them? Um, but he was just that kind of guy. So I think um, I'm probably a little bit like him in that I'm not. I can do this. I can come and sit here and chat to people. And you can buy a race course, race horse now. <laughs> don't, don't. It's a family. It's a horrible family obligation that I might have to someday. But we've got time for one more question. It's a lady right in the middle. <laughs> There's only three of us in this room, know what you're on about. Hi, I have. <laughs> Go on, tra translate. <laughs> and what would it be in, in English for the... <laughs> and we'll have one more question. Uh, this just... You mentioned your dog briefly. Presumably dogs are central to yeah. your way of life. Can you tell us a bit more about I like, that? I, yeah. I like this question. Well, the, the, have we got a, a shepherd with, without a good sheep dog is basically just a useless bugger. That's what we would call <laughs> it. But, um, you could, I could take all of you onto our fell with flags, whistles, whatever. There is no goddamn way we'd get those sheep off that mountain. It's just too big an area. No way. They're just, they'd be a bit confused. They might run away a bit, but they... Um, uh, to gather, to gather fells, to, to get a flock of sheep off the fell, or even when they're in the fields to catch one when it's lambing or it's got a health problem. It's, it's all about the dog. And you're as good or as bad as your dog. And I don't know whether he's come up yet, but if you get a chance, when you go down and you see the sheep outside, Joe, um, there's two kinds of good dogs, basically. There are field dogs, and I'm lucky I've got two really good field dogs. And there's fell dogs, and they're, they're different types. They're different kinds of intelligence. And uh, Joe has very, very good fell dogs. He's from a family of shepherds that for generations back has had a strain of fell dogs uh, that can do things that my dogs can't do. And uh, you may be seeing it on telly, but he could, I hope he's not here because his head will swell, but Joe can work his dogs like a, a mile up on a fell, a mile distant, and do exactly what he wants them to do. And the sheep will be hiding in the back end and they'll be coming down rocky squeeze and, and he'll fetch them right back to you. And uh, my, my dogs can do things in fields that his dogs can't do, but so yeah. Dogs are absolutely crucial. And I think that is all we've got time for. So thank you very much, James. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>